Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Press Club, the place where news happens. I'm Lisa Nicole Matthews, 114th President of the National Press Club and Assignment Manager for US Video at the Associated Press. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual headliners book and author talk with Lisa Napoli, author of Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Story of the Founding Mothers of NPR, and our very special guests, Susan Stamberg, Nina Totenberg, and Linda Wertheimer. We'll get started in a moment, but just a reminder that we are happy to accept your questions and we'll ask as many as time permits. To submit a question, please email headliners at press.org. 50 years and nine days ago, on April 20th, 1971, National Public Radio aired its first broadcast covering a U.S. Senate hearing on the Vietnam War. National Public Radio is now so much a part of the national fabric that it is hard for many of us to remember a time before All Things Considered, which premiered May 3rd, 1971, or Morning Edition, which came along in 1978. As groundbreaking as all this was, the NPR newsroom looked a lot like a lot of newsrooms around the country, overwhelmingly male and overwhelmingly white. Over the next few years, Four incredible women, Linda Wertheimer, Susan Stamberg, Nina Totenberg, and Koki Roberts, would join this newsroom and the profession of journalism. They would fight sexism. A male colleague once called their cluster of desks in the corner of the newsroom, the fallopian jungle. And we are going to talk about that. We will, they also covered decades of the most important stories in Washington and rose to become icons whose voices and reporting defined NPR. Joining us today is Lisa Napoli, a journalist herself, having worked at CNN, The New York Times, Marketplace, MSNBC, and KCRW. She tells the story of these four glass ceiling shattering women in her latest book, Susan, Linda, Nina, and Koki, The Extraordinary Story of the Founding Mothers of NPR. I really love saying that. Lisa is the author of three other books, Radio Shangri-La, Ray and Joan, and Up All Night, Ted Turner, CNN, The Birth of 24-Hour News. I am especially honored and delighted, I mean, seriously, to welcome three of the four NPR founding mothers, Susan Stamberg, Nina Totenberg, and Linda Wertheimer. Sadly, we are without their colleague and friend, Koki Roberts, who died in 2019. Ms. Stamberg joined NPR in 1971 and became the co-host in 1972 of NPR's award-winning news magazine, all Things Considered, for the next 14 years. She then hosted Weekend Edition Sunday and now reports on cultural issues for Morning Edition and Weekend Edition Saturday. Ms. Wertheimer also joined NPR at the network's inception in 1971 and is now senior national correspondent. She served as All Things Considered's first director, starting with its debut on May 3rd, 1971. Ms. Totenberg joined NPR in 1975 and is the network's award-winning legal affairs correspondent whose coverage of the Supreme Court and legal issues have won her widespread recognition. Her reports air regularly on NPR's news magazines, All Things Considered, Morning Edition, and Weekend Edition. So, Susan, Linda, Nina, Lisa, I am delighted to welcome you to the National Press Club. And as I said before we started, no one is sitting in the balcony today. <laughs> Everyone is on the floor and gets to ask questions. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does everybody listening to this even understand what you're talking about? Or is everybody as old as we are? They, they don't know. So no, we're going we're to tell them about it. So let me just say that we really should begin this with a hats off to the, the late Dan Robertson of the New York Times, who wrote a book called Girls in the ba Balcony. And I'll get Lisa Napoli to expand on that. Indeed, okay. indeed. Yeah, that's a part of uh, National Press Club history that uh, we could all live without. <laughs> it's a part of our history. <laughs> so Lisa, I'm going to start with you. Why did you decide to write this book? Well, because I tell the story. Women used to be banned from a lot of places. That's as 
pretty simple. No, I, you know, I, having written the book about Ted Turner and CNN, where I started my career as an intern, uh, an unpaid teenage intern from Brooklyn when cable was just starting, uh, that was a fascinating experience. And when that was done, it seemed an interesting time to look at another major force in news. And to tell the story, it seemed far more interesting to tell it through the eyes of these four incredible women. And what I didn't know, everybody knows who they are. I've worked adjacent to NPR in public radio on and off for years, but I didn't know where they come from. I just knew that they'd always been there as far as I knew. So <laughs> I was curious where and how, and it was lucky for me that with the 50th anniversary, happening and it, their stories dovetailed with the birth of 70s second wave feminism. It's no accident that that NPR, uh, the ground work was laid by these women and of course many other people, but these women were the front people for it. And I, I didn't know that when I started. So I wanted to share that story. I think the history is immensely important and uh, looking back is, is critical to understanding where we are today. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I really, really enjoyed uh, reading this book. It, it took me down the road quite a bit uh, yeah. from my time working <laughs> at an NPR member station. I want to ask uh, Susan and, and Linda, first off, reading the book, <laughs> the early days appeared to be absolutely no fun. No fun. Oh. <laughs> no, they were fabulous. No, fun. no, no, no. It was not fun. Okay. Oh. I was I was very angry reading the very beginning of this book. So so tell me about your what it was like at the, at the very beginning. To help our listeners just give us a little preview because we don't we want people to buy this book and read it. Oh, what an excellent idea! And by the way, it's a good book. She really did a good job, scarily good, because she's come up with things that I didn't know that I didn't remember, and I'm sure that's true for uh, for all of us here. <laughs> But it was fun. You have to understand, it. we were creating this thing. We were reinventing radio, essentially, which in back in the day, in the early 70s, was nothing but disc jockeys and some kind of times abusive uh, anchor people, call-in show anchors. Uh, otherwise, there was no content to it. There was nothing uh, that even tried to be reporting or serious. Uh, that, but, but we did that, and we had a whole lot of fun on the air as well. We were having fun in real life too with that because we were makers. We were making this thing that had never existed before. It was the bad part was no furniture and we had to sit on the floor, you know that kind of thing. But that <laughs> that quickly got got uh, cleared up. It it was a terrific and thrilling and terrifying, complicated time. I think that you're making it sound better than it was. Uh, I I really do, Linda. Tell me the truth. <laughs> It is, it is certainly true that we had, we, uh, we were sort of swimming upstream a lot of the time. Um, some years after these moments, these opening days, uh, Frank Mankiewicz, when he was asked why he had so many wonderful women working at NPR, he said, because you get more bang for the buck with the broad. Now, what he meant in the kindest way, really in the kindest way, was that women, although you didn't have to pay women as much as you had to pay men, and you got often women who were more talented than the more highly paid men would have been. So he and the previous people who started NPR loaded up the place with women. And now one of the things that was fabulous about working there was that there were so many women. Women who were, there were, there were married women, women with kids, women who were said been single for a long time. There were people who were like your sisters. And it was, it was a wonderful experience to work with your sisters also. Uh, whenever something horrible happened, you know, when somebody got like passed over or there was a big story and the person who should have been assigned was not assigned, you had this delegation of women who would just advance on the, on the bosses and then the bosses would regret that experience. <laughs> but, 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 She's for each, <laughs> yeah, uh, but for each of you, and you know, Nina, I'm bringing you in now. I mean, you had uh, some time where you were there before there were other women brought in. 
and, and I think that's really what, what I want to hear at least is how was it for you? You know, well, when I got there, yeah, we were, you know, Koki and Linda were already there. Right. Yeah, so was and, I. But, and very what, soon thereafter. And Susan. I mean, I mean, Susan, <laughs> I said Koki. Su Susan and Linda were already there. And very soon thereafter, uh, Steve Roberts arrived on my doorstep at NPR with Koki Roberts' resume. And I walked it over to, I think it was Jim Russell, and said, uh, this looks too good to miss out on. And you should try her. You said I began at NPR in 1975. I actually don't know when I began because um, in those days, they kept you on temp status for so long. It not only didn't pay you anything, they kept you on temp status so long. That <laughs> I, I went from being a temp to being a permanent employee. And that was certainly true for Koki for at least, I think, nine months. Oh. Yeah. I, went, I went home after the, the day that I was hired. Bill Simmering hired me. We had we had this interview. I could see that the interview was going badly, and I uh, and he asked me about previous work experience, and I said, "Well, I began my working life delivering groceries for Morrison's Grocery in Carlsbad, New Mexico. My dad owned it, and I got a driver's license at 14 and started driving the truck and delivering groceries." And his eyes lit up, and I thought, "Okay," he was afraid that I was some kind of snobby little girl who went to Wellesley and that and this sort of you know he thought maybe I was more the kind of of person that he wanted on NPR he always said he wanted the country the the network to sound like the country did mm -hmm. and so that that was a you know I, I turned the interview around and then he hired me and I went home and I said to Fred my husband it was a wonderful experience but they don't want to pay anything. I mean, <laughs> you could starve on that salary. And he said, that's okay, because I have a job and I can pay for the food. And this explains so much about why there were so many women, uh, m more than in, in other news uh, organizations, certainly, because those uh, who were married could afford the, the salaries because there were married. second salaries in their homes. And so it made it, it opened, that opened a lot of doors for us. I wasn't married then, so I was really. Yeah, I was <laughs> really but you found your way. And didn't but I was so, I mean, I, I had jobs in print and I, I'd always been horribly underpaid compared to the men and I knew it. And I once complained and nothing happened. And then I came to NPR where everybody was underpaid. As right. far as I know, everybody was seriously <laughs> underpaid. Um, and. I just was very, it, it's one of the things that makes that era so different from this era is that I was just grateful to have the job. Uh, I, would, I would say that that is always what you just said, Nina. A lot of journalists say, I'm just grateful to have the job. They are so happy to, to just provide the service. Mm -hmm. Talk about like one of your first moments where you realized I'm doing like, I'm, I'm making a difference. Each each of you, because the very, there were the moments very, in the book. The day we went on the air, I think I was only, I'm the only one of us who was actually there that I was. day. Hey, hey, I was. Okay. <laughs> there was a, the, you know, we, we were having a riot in Washington. I mean, there were, it was unbelievable. And, and coming, I came to work on the bus, this being NBR, I rode the bus to work. I got to work on the bus and people were trying to throw tear gas grenades into the bus. It was an anti-Vietnam anti War demonstration. 20,000 people. We all- Trying to I shut mean, down the I, government. I, I, my, the thing that was, <laughs> I was terrified I was going to throw up over. It, I mean, you know, that's what tear gas does to me. Um, and it was it was an awful horrible day, but still, we you know I had the strong sense that we got I got to work, I got upstairs where I was supposed to be and started helping to put the program together. It was and a that great news day. That was an enormous uh, yeah. you know accomplishment. I thought. And it, it turned so out that it turned out that the way we broadcast that was we had only we had no resources at all. We had only five reporters in those days, and they all were set out into the field, 
fanning out and gathering, collecting tape, and then coming in and throwing reels of tape across the control room to get it on the air. Um, but what was so extraordinary about it, it turns out, was the only document of that day, the way we did it, on the air. And it stands now, I was listening to pieces of it the other day, it still stands. There are a lot of bumps in the program, as you can imagine, that first program. But it's so powerful. And it's a kind of radio that had not existed. It just didn't. You had a reporter going up to a, a, a cop and saying, excuse me, officer, is that a technique driving your motorcycle directly into the crowd? <laughs> and the officer said, nah, it's no technique, but I got to get through. How am I going to do it? I mean, it was that kind of sound of on the street, people of, of the country there to do their demonstration, express themselves, and there we were broadcasting it. Nina, you look like you were going to add something there. Yeah, well, I wasn't there at the creation, so to speak. No, but, but what was one of your, your standout moments where you realized oh. that you were, you were delivering a service that America needed? Well, I, I was a... I did love scoops. I still do, but they're really hard to come by on my beat. But and I covered a lot more than I cover now because I would say there are probably 10 reporters who cover what I now, what I used to cover. But I didn't just cover the Supreme Court. I covered the Justice Department, the House and Senate Judiciary Committees, every scandal, every special prosecutor, and the intelligence community. So there's a, that's a lot of ground. But I, you know, I... I had scoops, and they were scoops that were even credited by newspapers the following days. But obviously, when I broke the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas story, it was a very big deal. And what I really remember was the day that they they had to reopen the hearings, and uh, she was to testify, and Thomas was to testify. And I knew it was a big deal, but I walked into the Russell Senate office building. And all of the networks, usually we were the only people who carried hearing this live. It had not occurred to me that other networks would also be carrying the hearing this live. And every major anchor in America was there along with me. I was co-anchoring the hearings and doing the story for ATC that night and for Morning Edition. And I thought, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was quite a moment. So talking about Koki a little bit, Lisa, you, you referred to the 90s as the decade of Koki Roberts. Talk a little bit about why, why you describe the 90s as the decade of Koki. Well, these women know it well, far better than I do, but it was so interesting to research Koki and her history. Uh, of course, I always knew her as fully formed mega star Koki Roberts. Um, and, and to go back in her history and see how hard she struggled, as did all of the, the four women in getting jobs early on because jobs were restricted, women were tokens in newsrooms. And once they all busted through, uh, and Koki busted through on television, I, I did a talk the other day where someone took issue with me saying that Koki got that job on David Brinkley because she was a woman, but Koki said that. They needed a woman. They were ready to cast a woman analyst on that show for the first time because they recognized they needed to acknowledge half the population. And it, you know, the reason she excelled and 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 zoomed on beyond that is because she was such a superstar but she got that first break in in the 80s the late 80s because they needed they needed to have the voice of a woman and all four women helped solidify the fact that women were intelligent articulate people about things other than society uh junk mm -hmm. which is what women mostly were relegated to mm -hmm. covering and but Koki zoomed through because of that television uh, opportunity that she got and mastered, and she just became this ubiquitous presence in, in the world. Again, these women can talk about her so differently than I can, but just studying it as a media historian, it was just a marvel to behold how she just, you know, did the TV, kept her radio job, which was very unusual at that time, started writing books, started giving speeches. She was the voice, this, this iconic voice. She became this iconic voice. And so that was interesting to, as I say, reverse engineer it. 
I, I think one of the interesting things is that even today, somebody would say to me, well, she got that job because she was a woman. And the fact is that when they looked around and decided to, on television, and decided to find a woman, um, and that was true to a lesser extent for me because I did for 20 years, I was the woman uh, on a, a, a talk show. Uh, they looked around and there was nobody that they trusted very much because they didn't know anybody. They didn't have people in their own newsrooms who would have been the right. largely candidates. And there we were sitting uh, as people who could be called upon to talk about, in Susan's case, culture, in Linda's case, the Hill, and you know, and all kinds of, and, and in Kofi's case, just everything. And she was quite the generalist, very, very strong. <laughs> Well, but what she brought to it, to the job, it wasn't only the television made her, she made television series because she was a child of the Congress and she had years, decades, lineage of knowledge and information about all those committees and how things work. Linda discovered that you, you were the student uh, to <laughs> Congress when you first came in, right? And, and yes. you were studying as hard as you could. And then there was Koki who grew up in it. Her parents it was a little, were, were it was a little members bit, of the It was a tiny bit upsetting when Koki was hired and I thought, I just have begun to get control of this information <laughs> and a stable of sources and I'm ready to go. And here she comes. <laughs> Some of these men have known her since she was five. I mean, no kidding. They yeah. knew her since when she was a little bitty kid. Um, she knew her way around. I mean, one of the things I've always done when I've gone someplace is to try to figure out, you know, to try to understand what, to never get lost, you know, to, to find my way around, to understand who are the people I should be talking to, who are the people that I need to know. And of course, imagine my <laughs> chagrin when I discovered that Koki was born with it. She knew it all already. <laughs> because of her parents. Yeah. yeah. And so, it was it was a very interesting thing. But the thing that, that makes the thing that made the big, big difference in my life and in all our lives was that Koki's generosity of spirit was so extraordinary that she had no problem. She she it wouldn't occur to her to try to do me in and get me out of her way. It wouldn't occur to her. What did occur to her was that we should both attack this thing with, with each of us putting our best foot forward. And we had, we had these sort of little gentlewoman agreements that, for example, uh, if, if one of us was just completely and utterly sick of a particular debate or what most frequently happened was that Koki got sick of the Senate. And I got sick of the house, so we would uh, trade. And we would just tell the editor that Koki needs to cover the blah, 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 and I will be at the, blah, blah, and we would assign ourselves. And they, you know, what were they going to do? They said, okay. What about competition factor? I mean, did that exist uh, between you and other women? Uh, you already had the obstacle of being a woman yourself. <laughs> but then the competition factor, how did that, how did that weigh in? We got there first, you know, and so uh, maybe everybody wanted to be the anchor person, but I happened to be, you know, and I was having a very good time flourishing in it, as a matter of fact. So I wasn't going anywhere and I was not aware of, you know, that sort of the long nail cliche about women and, and uh, our ambitions. We are ambitious, but the atmosphere really at NPR particularly in the early days, was very different. Between and among the, the, we women, okay. we very reached out and helped others get hired and brought them in and made and looked after them and were there to mentor them and to give them uh, advice and, and thoughts. And like Ms. Totenberg, I take a lot of credit. I only learned it since uh, you've been working on this book, Lisa, that uh, when she first started, because she was a excellent print reporter but hadn't done radio that she came in the studio an early time and she sat and talked like this 
and told me, uh, and I told her, Nina, you don't want to cover your mouth when, you, <laughs> when you're on the air. <laughs> so I take such credit for that, that America got to hear the voice of Nina Totenberg <laughs> with some help from me. So you guys had really strong, strong alliances among, oh, yeah. amongst yourselves and other yes. women. Yes. Did you, did you have strong alliances with any other journalists, like Black journalists, that uh, worked alongside you or, or any particular male journalists that, that, that yes. were engaged? I sure. mean, we had, we had very good friends. Uh, I mean, it was partly that uh, we, were not, we were not to be bossed. And so, you know, we got, we got to sit at the table and, and do the job we wanted to do. Was it, I, how I does think, it that, I mean, Michelle, that Michelle Martin says we're unbossed, unsomething, and something? I don't remember <laughs> what she says, and I mean it's not entirely true, but we do have bosses, and they, and the bigger an organization gets, of course, the more bosses there are, and the more power they have, and the less you have. But for most of our early lives at NPR, um, it, you know, as long as Linda and I helped start the union of NPR. And it took years. It didn't just take, you know, like six months. It took oh, almost two years. And it took at least that much off my life. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. thoroughly horrible. Throughout, throughout the book, and I know even when I was trying to get to NPR, there was always this thing that NPR was just on the brink of it's exploding. Destruction. Yeah. Yes. Or, well, or I used dissolving. Yeah. So uh, oh. talk, talk about the stress that you guys were under, uh, you know, and, and just the whole thing about radio itself, you know, yeah. imploding as, as a platform. <laughs> well, well that, we was, that was one the of time, the, the, the silly things about our... I'm going to say go Susan and then okay. Linda. Okay. Go Susan. Uh, the timing was good for us because uh, we came along around the time that FM radio was mandatory mandatory to be put in automobiles. And both of our uh, news programs, the news magazines, morning and evening, were designed to be commuter shows. So there was an audience. It took years to build it. That uh, president, one of the presidents, Frank Mankiewicz, whom uh, Linda mentioned, did a lot of good for us. He had been Bobby Kennedy's spokesperson. He was the man who told the world that Bobby had been killed. Um, and so he uh, got a lot of attention for us. And uh, there were a lot of newspaper articles about us and him when he ca came. And the second great contributor to widening our viewership was Nina when she broke that. Uh, well, you broke a number of stories before Anita Hill, but it was that one that really helped between the two, those two people to put us on the map. Uh, and what's happening now, uh, which is, is very sad, wonderful, but sad, is with the collapse of newspapers all over the country in towns where there used to be three papers, maybe more, and those papers began collapsing and getting their plugs pulled. We, we, uh, and television is not doing news the way it had the great ambition to do when we went on the air with the three big networks. That was it. Now it's much more opinionation than it is the deliverers of news. Um, we, we end up being the last person's standing electronically, you know, the, the place to come. And it's true for our listeners as well as our websites. Uh, less so for them, but particularly radio, uh, because we were the ones that presented news seriously, took it seriously, and delivered it seriously. So it was a whole combination as it rolled through those 50 years. Yeah, but there were so many threats to NPR's budget and bottom oh, line, sure. and rumors sure. that they were going out of business. Linda? It happened, it happened about, you know, two or three times a week. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not only was radio declared to be totally over and dead, Dead. But we were totally over and dead. Now, most of the time, you know, NPR, I always say that most of the time I felt that we were all lined up, standing on the edge of a cliff, looking into the abyss. But there were times when we were like hanging over the edge of the abyss <laughs> with our little fingers trying, you know, trying to get back up. Yeah. It, was, it was just very scary. 
Um, uh, budget crises and political uh, pressures. And there was a whole lot of stuff. But you know what saved us in enormous part were our listeners. Because you could not have found more faithful, more loyal and enthusiastic people than the, those who discovered us and stu stood by us, wrote to their members of Congress when, when necessary to say, back off, leave them alone, don't touch them. And the members knew it too, as Linda will tell you, because she discovered that in, on Capitol Hill in the beginning, we all had to, if you tried to line up a guest, stand up and do a tap dance. Hello, I'm Susan Stanford, National Public Radio, a brand new network going across the country. <laughs> it ate up all our time. Luckily, we were not on the air. But uh, one of the people uh, who did know who we were was Tip O'Neill. Yes. And Tip O'Neill would, uh, would give us, he would always give us interviews, he would always tell us things. I thought for a long time that it was that, that part of the reason we were getting treated so well was that uh, he loved Koki. He especially loved Koki's mother, and he was a good friend of Koki's dad. But I found out that it was, he felt that he was one of the creators of NPR. The <laughs> Congress invented public broadcasting, and he felt responsible for us. And so he was, you know, he was always trying to help us with news. Uh, or help us with whatever we, you know, whatever we needed. Frank Mankiewicz was, uh, Frank Mankiewicz was a great political person. And he also uh, helped us deal with some of the political difficulties that, you know, that would nationally, naturally arise. But I think that, uh, I think that we, the, the thing, I mean, we did a lot of things that were awfully good. You know, we had uh, we had some very good, very good magazine programs and so on. But the things that that I think we all did as well as anybody could was bringing all of the voices to other people. You know, the Congress of the United States talking to the strange and wonderful people who 50 years ago were not all quaffed and right. airbrushed mm -hmm. as they are now. Right. I remember, Linda, I remember uh, a story you told. You were out covering, I think it must have been the Iowa caucuses, and you were in a field, and you were trying to get this guy to come down and talk to you off, off of his tractor. Uh, tractor. <laughs> so tell us. It's a great story. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, it was so cold. You can't believe how cold it was. It was so cold. But what I don't remember is he, he said something very nice to me. He climbed down. And he said something very nice. And then he said, I said, well, do you listen to NBR? I thought he must, you know. He's, he thought you were a star. He said, you're Linda Worth on You're Linda You were probably <laughs> wearing that red padded coat of yours, which was uh, yeah, not I, exactly I, 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 And he said, I, you're Linda Worth on Oh, my God. And then he said. <laughs> you tell him. <laughs> and then he said, remember. I, he had been listening. In his show. tractor. On his tractor, tractor. Yeah. yeah. He said he would drive along in his tractor listening to us. Yeah. And sometimes he would just, he would do what, you know, a lot, lots of our listeners tell us that they have driveway moments where they are listening to something <laughs> and they get to their house and they drive into the driveway, but the piece isn't over. Right. So they wait for the piece to be over before they, that. you know, go in. And he said that he would, he would get down to the end of the row and he would think that it was time to stop, but the piece wasn't over. So we turn around, go down the other end of the road. <laughs> he went down the corn. <laughs> yeah. No, they were so wonderful. Yeah. I, I insisted that many of our earliest stations were those stations out in the Middle West, farmers, farming communities. And we were, we were a, a real, uh, they they didn't hear the news. They didn't get all the opportunities that people on the coasts did, and so we were we were, we connected them we were to the, the rest of the country, right. and they were absolutely wonderful to us. And I you know I loved the uh, every once in a while in a in a meeting at NPR I would deliver a lecture on the farm economy and how important it. <laughs> <laughs> And we would go, oh, goody, 
Um, yeah. <laughs> there he goes so, again. <laughs> so if we can if we can go back to Capitol Hill though, because you all kind of turned into lobbyists of sorts uh -uh. Uh, while you were, were on the Hill. Did you ever have a concern that your reporting and your advocating for your organization uh, was kind of messy? I think the only, the only time that, uh, that Kofi and I ever, ever really dived into it was when we were, we really were right on the edge of extinction. And, uh, and we- Eight million dollars in debt. Yeah. And it was a terrible thing. And, uh, and we did, we did at that point, lend a hand. <laughs> and I was terrified that somebody would find out. I was terrified that it was wildly not what NPR had ever done or I had ever done. It was very upsetting. But on the other hand, uh, I didn't tell Lisa this story because I, I couldn't possibly do it, but we, we made a big difference, Kelki and I did that day. Lisa, when you were reporting, when you were interviewing these ladies, was there anything that stood out for you that you had never heard? Because you, you've got quite a bit of uh, history in terms of talking to folks in the media. And, and, and watching the growth of different platforms. Talk about something that stood out for you specifically about the way NPR came together and the way these women worked together. Well, I, I, I couldn't because there's so many things. So well, many give us one along or two. the way. Um, you know, I have to say that I, I just, in my mind, keep going back to archives and how crucial they were in my writing this book. Uh, Susan left her papers to the special collections at the University of Maryland and going through her fan mail, um, I knew that she was beloved. I'd read her books. I'd read Linda's book. I knew these women were beloved, but to go through Susan's fan mail, I know that doesn't sound very, you know, high-minded, probably not what you're- No, the ones about. from George Clooney were very good. <laughs> <laughs> they were, please, it was, please george it, it was amazing what people would do for you what they felt about you and and trying to put yourself in the place as i was reading it of the 1970s when i was you know not too with it at that point i was still pretty young and and knowing that people revered this service just really put a fine point on it. As I said before, with CNN, knowing how CNN came out of the gate and a million people were able to receive CNN when it first started transmitting, it was wow. not an important force. Cable wasn't an important force. So then to go back 10 years and know that FM radio, which I always took for granted, wasn't a major force and that these voices were transmitting to farmers around the country and bringing stories to them that people had never heard. That alone was just remarkable. But every step along the way of the milestones that happened, Nina coming in and breaking news in a place that nobody had ever heard of, which every journalist listening knows is way harder to do than when you're at the New York Times and people serve up scoops to you. When you have to really trounce around as Nina did, that's incredible. Linda, you know, making a way for herself, having come from New Mexico in this radio network, first as a consumer reporter, and then learning everything about the Hill. And then Susan, of course, taking her passion for arts and translating it into uh, just an unbelievable archive of, of interviews with, with important people from the 20th century. It's just a mind blowing thing to witness the birth of a network. And mm -hmm. I think that that's what get lost. And it gets lost because we just do think of it as a fully formed entity. Yeah. I just want to also say too, Nina had asked me to tell the story about Nan Robertson. The other thing that's amazing, I'm in my fifties. I knew from my mother that women didn't always have their own bank accounts. I knew that women couldn't get mortgages. I knew how hard it was for, for women because my mother pushed me out the door to make sure that I didn't have it happen to me, what happened to her. But until I started reading things like Nan Robertson's book about what it was like at the New York Times, where I used to work, when women were ranked based on their appearances when they came in for job interviews, um, and, and Nan wrote about how women were prohibited from the National Press Club until they fought 
and were allowed to come up to the balcony to observe newsmakers down below <laughs> during lunchtime. I, I mean, of course I knew that people of color had had that struggle, but I didn't realize what women had gone through in the 60s. I, I knew that job ads used to be segregated for women, for men, but I didn't really understand it until I started looking at newspaper ads and hearing the stories that these women told mm -hmm. time and again of being barred. I mean, imagine someone telling Nina, you can't be a reporter. You know, you can only cover fashion. <laughs> it's just incredible. But it's so important to know that. It wasn't that. even interesting fashion. I was thinking that. <laughs> right. you I was done supposed well. to rewrite the wedding get down stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's I, what women I, were allowed to do. Yeah. Yep. I started out making the joke about, um, you know, no one will be in the balcony today. Uh, we're all on the floor. And, you know, just accept my apologies on behalf of <laughs> the history of the National Press Club. Um, folks just didn't know what they were doing back then. They didn't know <laughs> what they were missing out on in terms of having women contribute to the report. Go, Lisa. But just as these women created their old old girls network, as they as they called it, mm -hmm. women bef when they were excluded from the National Press Club started the Women's Press Club, yes. and they let men in <laughs> and black people. For that matter. I mean, they let people in to their club, and by the way, they um, opened their club up. Uh, before before the National Press Club did. So it's not your fault, Lisa. Yeah, know. I, I, know I know it's not. I, I just, there was a, a review of Lisa's book and the only, uh, in the New York Times, and the only sort of critical paragraph sort of said, oh, well, you know, the only thing that she didn't do was sort of give us the behind the scenes truth about, and the inference was how these women were really at each other's throats. Right. That was right. really... That was really what it was. A, it was a nice way of saying that, and I think that we were never at each other's throats. And it's never. not. This is not a PR job here. Right. We were all young, trying to get a foothold, helping each other, and understanding that we couldn't do it one without the other. That yeah. we had to be together, and yeah. we liked each other, and we shared experiences you know we were you know either when i i was not married initially but then of course i got married and and you know we would share experiences that you inevitably have with a husband who doesn't love the fact that you have to be away for you know a week and or kids who were howling on the phone i used to sit opposite pokey and one day she's on deadline she's typing do, 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 do. and becca who's now in her she she's on the phone and she's trying to she somebody asked her to go out on a you know come to her house to play and becca wanted to go to that house but she'd already promised somebody else and Kofi said to her uh, i remember her saying this absolutely clearly becca you made a commitment you have to live up to your commitments you must you cannot accept this other invitation and i could hear becca howling howling and Kofi is typing and she is laughing, <laughs> and she is. You know. <laughs> so, I have to ask you, Nina, because there is a part in the book where you are referred to as the screamer. Um, can, can you? I, and and I, I look at you now, and I'm like, no oh, way, she oh, yeah. was ever the screamer. Oh, I was, I was, especially in union negotiations. Yes, as, and as things, you know, went along, and the union. You know, we would get to the point where we were, there was some big issue that if we had to solve and management was being absolutely impossible, or as Koki would have said, immoral. In those union negotiations, Koki used to um, do her embroidery. She was like Madame Defarge taking names. And, <laughs> and Linda, Linda would sit there being patient. And at some point, my job was to lose my temper which in those days was really pretty easy for me to do. I'm sorry to say that I didn't learn to control that better until I was considerably older. So I would just blow sky high and it would have some effect. And the other, I had two, and also two men, Robert Siegel and Scott Simon also had role playing that they did. And that's how we got these things done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who who called you guys uh, the fallopian uh, I, I jungle. The what was it? Jungle. 
He meant he's no longer with us. <laughs> well, he's alive. He's alive. He's but, alive. But, <laughs> he's but alive. how did you find out that that was what oh, they were they calling were not him? Look, we're reporters. Yeah, I, I say. Well, we're he didn't try to. He didn't try to conceal it. I oh, don't he, think, right? Yeah, it wasn't like he, it was behind your back. No, he and he he felt it was it was a you know I don't think he meant it viciously. Let's put it this way. I think he meant it ironically. Um, and but and it, and you're too kind. Oh, and this is this is like thirty years ago we're talking about. So or twenty years ago at least. No, probably 50. 30. Oh, 40, probably 40. 40. Yeah. Okay, forty years ago. Sorry. And so you know, it's very hard to judge something like that. We thought it was funny. We, and, well, and that is what yeah. that I was just going to say. I think we thought it was funny. Yeah. We, we but were, it wasn't, you know, he wasn't dangerous to us. Yeah, no. that's right. So that kind of language today would cause a Me Too moment, I think. Oh, it, yeah. It, it, yeah. It would, <laughs> people would completely go Probably. off in the newsroom. Talk yeah. about how things have changed substantially. Uh, well, I, I, I want to talk about how the how our format has changed, how the format has changed. I mean, you wouldn't even recognize radio now, but in particularly how uh, journalists, male and female journalists, work together now versus the things that you had to go through. Coming well, up. I can't I can't speak to exactly that, but I'm I'm living proof of a major change. That is, I am the first woman who anchored a nightly network news broadcast. Look around you now. On television, they're everywhere, sitting at they're that everywhere. anchor desk. <laughs> Listen to our air. Every single broadcast that we have has a woman who also anchors that. But uh, it was just me alone doing it in the beginning and for uh, for many many years. So that's that's a major break. And doing the news, uh, it's different. It was different at NPR, and it was different uh, in part because I was a woman and a parent of a young child and a wife, and I could lobby hard at editorial meetings every morning that, that those were issues that needed to be covered on our news broadcast. And that was very unusual in those days. They were not considered part of the news. I also felt the arts were very important to cover. And uh, I began, I was always in love with them all my life, and I found room for them uh, on, on our news broadcast. So uh, women at the table, Make, can make a tremendous difference. And, and to see it 50 years later have flourished that way is very satisfying. Yes, it is. And to think that we, we know a lot of these young women, we may have helped them along the way or inspired them somehow, is it's a wonderful thing. One of the great things that we did not know was that uh, we, were, we were in a startup, sort of a startup for women. <laughs> and that made a big difference too, because we did not, you know, as I, as I frequently say, when I make a talk, I say, it was, it was not, a, it was not this kind of thing where, you know, at the New York Times, I would have had to take a gun, go into the newsroom and shoot several political reporters before they would need me to come on, on board and work for them. NPR needed me from the start. So, you know, I was, it, they were willing to take that chance and it was a profitable chance for them to take as well. Yeah, feeling needed is always so important. That's, that is really good <laughs> to hear. Uh, talk about camaraderie uh, because, you know, being from AP, once AP, always AP. <laughs> is it the same at National Public Radio, at NPR? And talk about the transition from being National Public Radio to now NPR. Yeah, because radio, everyone said, uh, as has already been pointed out, that radio is dying and that we're, we were instead a media organization. And so they didn't want it to have a say it. And I, in speeches, would always say, hi, I'm Susan Stanford from National Public Radio, just <laughs> you know, to make it clear that it, it, we weren't what we had been. Of course, we still are. Uh, and, and our radio broadcasts are strong, very different from what we started out with for, uh, for various reasons. But uh, there we are with it. Radio hasn't died. And certainly the need, the public need for the human voice telling stories that will never, ever go away. Well, and who would have thought that, you know, at the time when, we, when they were worried that radio was going away and then there was Sirius and the, and the other one, 
And then were they going to, you know, would people listen to them and not us? And who would have thought that we would be also, the, in some sense, the, the mothers and fathers of podcasts? Yeah. You know, which are the, the thing of today. And the most cutting edge, the most edgy, the most modern thing possible today is a podcast. Everybody's trying to do one. I don't know how anybody has time to listen to all the podcasts that they would, they would be interested in. We've only got 10 minutes left. So I'm going to, if I have two final questions. So before I get to my final questions, I want to get my, get my thank yous out of the way here. So um, before I ask the final question, let me take a moment to recognize the organizers of today's event. Headliners co-team leaders, Donna Limewan and Lori Russo. Today's headliner event coordinator, Alyssa Free. Club Communications Director, Lindsay Underwood, and Club Executive Director, Bill McCarran. I'd also like to tell you about some upcoming NPC headliners. On May 10th at 11 a.m., we'll hear from Republican Representative Adam Kinzinger. Uh, he's going to address the future of the Republican Party and other issues facing the nation. Also on May 10th at 2 p.m., Don Lemon, host of CNN Tonight with Don Lemon, will join us to discuss his new book, This is the Fire, What I Say to My Friends About Racism. Mm -hmm. And on May 12th, we will talk with actor Gabrielle Carteris. She's president of the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, also known as SAG-AFTRA. Yeah. We're gonna talk about the power for workers post-pandemic. So we hope you'll join us for that. Now for our last questions. First over to you, Lisa. You have written, as I mentioned before, so many books about media and the media landscape. And, and this book is, is really, really fantastic. The, the, the tales of the women and the interweaving of their stories there uh, through the book is, is beautiful. Thank but you. I have to ask you, what is next? I mean, what's the next big, Lisa Napoli story because I can look out on the media landscape and see so many different different stories to tell. Oh, just, but what what is it for you? No, you then then direct message me. I want to hear what they are. <laughs> <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless Nina needs a ghostwriter for her memoir, or you do, Lisa. Since you know we got Susan and Linda, they've got books out there. No, I'm I'm taking a much needed break right now. I'm actually in graduate school at CUNY online, uh -huh. um, studying biography and memoir because writing biographies and memoirs haven't been enough for me. I love the <laughs> form, and it's a wonderful and thrilling. Story sort of application of journalism to me. So we'll see. I've got some ideas, but I'll, I'd love to hear yours. So let me know. I did work at the New York Times at a really important point at it, 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 its existence, which is when we started going online. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I could sell that book, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see. Oh, the, the New York Times has changed greatly yes, over has. the years. Yes, uh, so yeah, there's definitely a story there. So for each one of our very, very special guests, Nina, Linda and Susan. Um, I don't think that I really got out of you one of your one of the major obstacles that you faced coming up through NPR. And then any piece of advice that you have for young journalists, young women journalists who want to be where you are in the future. I can start. So start. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Love um, it advice journalism is the most noble profession that you can practice the trick is to find a way to get paid for it as all of these forms begin disappearing the the, the ones that we know like newspapers for example and i think it's a lot so much more competitive now on on what's left that it's that it's tougher but i can encourage people more than to say do this work it, it's in behalf of the democracy it's in behalf sometimes of your own mental uh, focus and strength and your talents and your abilities. I used to, I raised our son uh, by telling him, find something that you love to do and then figure out a way to get paid to do it. And he's an actor. So he went for a number of years only doing half of that. But 
thank goodness he's doing just fine <laughs> he's dead he's accomplished but and and it is possible to do it if you're good enough you work hard enough and, and the, the the luck is with you linda what was the obstacle. other half of the question that you asked susan yeah. Yeah, she didn't answer my obstacle. You guys, I no, know obstacles. encountered obstacles. We, uh, but we never talk about them. We never complain, you know, we're just so true to <laughs> right <laughs> girls. Know. Well, I think I, I think we, we have at the at various times had bad bosses. And and it has just been, you know, infra infuriating in the extreme to have to uh, you know have to have to listen to this guy. And it was always a guy um, who, who didn't know essentially what they were talking about. And, you know, and just try to be sort of. So one of the things we did was we all took lessons from Koki and how not to be vicious to this person and how to like, you know, sort of be charitable, think well of them and, and then finally get to what to do what you wanted to do by that time they were charmed and would let you or they were, a, they didn't want to still be the bad guy. They wanted to be the good guy. Uh, but that, that, was, that was it, I think. Having brainless managers was the thing that just, it just drove me crazy. It didn't happen very often, but every once in a while it did. I must say that the career, you know, journalism is, is one of the best jobs in the world, I think. All Things Considered, when I anchored All Things Considered, it was easily the best job I've ever had. And I can't imagine any, I could ever have another that was as good as that. Because anything you wanted to know about, you could learn about. Anything you wanted to, uh, any, anything you, any question you wanted to raise, you could do it. Uh, whatever interested you could be part of that program. One of the reasons was that the program was very long and we had very few, a rather small staff. And so, you know, if somebody had an idea that they were eager to put forward, um, generally speaking, it was okay to do it. We had the best time. It was just covering Congress and covering politics, especially politics, because I love politics and politicians with a few exceptions. Uh, and I have, you know, I've, I never have had such a good time as I have had on a really kind of scary election year. I, I think, you know, I, I just think that doing that work, it's great work and doing that work is, has, has been a joy to me for my whole life, my whole working life. Nina, we've just got about three minutes left. I'll leave the last word for you. What was your major obstacle and what advice do you have for young journalists coming up today? Well, always getting a job was the major obstacle. You know, for the first, probably until I came to NPR, every place I worked, I was either the only woman or one of two women, or, you know, and I was not taken seriously at all. And then I came to NPR where there were women who were way smarter than I am. and very accomplished <laughs> and from whom I could learn and who were my colleagues and my friends and have been for the rest of my life. And returning to Nan Robertson, who until her death remained a, a really close friend. I met her when I was on the bus covering the New Hampshire primary in 1968. And I was the only woman on the bus and I will not surprise you to know that there was great camaraderie on the bus among the guys, but they never sat next to me. Um, and they never really invited me to do anything with them. Even some of them who later became really good friends didn't ever remember and I didn't remind them how picky they were in those days. And I was sitting alone trying to look like, you know, I was 20 something and I'm and I'm sitting alone trying to be, look like my feelings aren't hurt. That people come on, they look, where should they sit? It's never with me. And Nan Robertson, who I didn't know, walked onto that bus, looked around the bus, saw me, made a beeline for me, sat down with me, and we were friends for the rest of our lives. Wow. Her death. And that is really 
that's the kind of friendship I had with the women of NPR. And the only thing I regret about the modern NPR is that it's so big, it's really hard to make those kinds of friendships. Mm -hmm. um, but I revel in the fact that we have them, had them, and will continue to have them. Fantastic. Well, this the hour went by too fast, uh, but I'm still girl fanning. And <laughs> really, 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 really appreciate all of you. Lisa Napoli, thank you for writing the book. Thank you. Nina, Linda, Susan, thank you for being the pioneers that you are and for, for giving, the, giving us the structure. Because I think NPR is about as American as baseball and apple pie. <laughs> it. So Great. Thank, thank you so much for joining us at the National Press Club. We hope to have you in person one day when, uh, when it's safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Lisa and Lisa. Thank you. <laughs>